here we are back uh, together. Good afternoon, our LPA community and audience. Good afternoon, Aline, Professor Aline Müller. Good afternoon. <laughs> this is a huge privilege, uh, Professor, to host you uh, because uh, you know you are at, sitting at the forefront of what's going on in Luxembourg in relation to uh, the current crisis. Uh, for us as a private equity and venture capital community, it's of utmost importance to understand what is going on behind the scenes and what are the implications of, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic so far, but most of all, to look at uh, the remedies that you have been working on together closely with partners and, and, and government stakeholders. So this we're gonna spend at least an hour together. This is meant to be a webinar uh, based on Q&A. So I think first you're gonna spend a bit of uh, time explaining to us who you are and what LISER is, because you are here as the head of LISER, the Luxembourg Institute for Social Socioeconomic Research. Uh, and uh, tell us about you, because we're always fascinating, fascinated sorry, to hear from uh, successful ladies. We need more role models like yourselves. And if I may say at this stage, uh, you are actually Luxembourger. Mm -hmm. Uh, which you know adds to the pleasure of hosting you today without being nationalistic. Uh, the fact that you spent a quarter of a century outside your country before coming back some three, four years ago, uh, mm -hmm. having spent a lot of your life actually learning and studying because you're a PhD holder and graduate, you were an assistant professor, you still are. Uh, you worked and lived in different European countries before coming back home, also for personal reasons, because you know, last but not least, you are a mom. And uh, we know that also is a real job. So congratulations on achieving so much in your uh, young life still. And, uh, and, and, and also we, we would like to understand from you, uh, of course, what is, your, you know, what is the purpose of what you're doing now? Uh, for us, again, as I said earlier, private equity is about the real economy. It's about jobs, innovation. And we know that everything has been deeply disrupted um, in the last uh, in the last few months so professor if you don't mind i will allow uh, the audience to interact with you as much as mm -hmm. i do mm -hmm. if, uh, with pleasure <laughs> that's and, why I'm uh, here. <laughs> that, that's wonderful and i suggest that we spend at least half an hour of q and a's because i read the papers that we also sent to the audience mm -hmm. and i'm not sure i understood all the technical aspects of it but it did trigger some uh, fundamental uh, aspects linked to how we live and how we work. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, uh, if, if you don't mind uh, telling us about uh, LISER and its mission and uh, also complete uh, the background that I've been giving about you because it's totally sketchy, obviously. And, and thank you so much for being here and we'll host you for sure to, uh, for a live event in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, so the mission of LISA is to advance knowledge in the socioeconomic field. So really uh, both from a living condition perspective, but also from an economic perspective, from a labor market perspective, and also from a spatial perspective. Um, it's not only about scientific output, but it's also about impact. So impact for economy and also for society. And that's what is, um, I would say, that the heart of our values is to actually also collect as much information from society, from the economy, and to bring it back uh, through scientific work uh, in form of a common good. That's really uh, what's LISA. And that's also what made me so passionate about uh, the idea of coming back. Um, my background in it's true, it's more uh, finance. So I started with mathematics. <laughs> um, uh, I was first a mathematician and then uh, I, I had a, a finance background, did my PhD on uh, international foreign exchange exposure, started my career as assistant professor at uh, Nijmegen University, Radboud University, then was at several uh, Dutch universities and then came back to a Belgian university where I became full professor. Um, now I'm back for three and a half years. Um, in the beginning a little bit skeptical or careful because I, the, the society I knew when I, when I left was a little bit different from the one uh, we have now. I'm very happy also for my family that we are in an international society because that was important. So what was the biggest change you found after 27 years away? 
I think it's exactly that. This uh, what I was actually, more, more international. More worried, yeah. This international. The fact that when you go now to Luxembourg City, you all, I have been traveling enormously. That's that's the the major change also in my life. I had an extremely international uh, professional career. I was traveling all the time. Uh, so actually, when when we arrived here in Luxembourg, the kids didn't know that I would travel a little bit less and um, more, much more, uh, yeah, much less, I would yeah. even say, but we, and we, they were we, happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we always speak uh, amongst the team and the members of purpose. So, I mean, you're still a professor of mm -hmm. finance, but what is the purpose that really drove your decision to join Lizer and kind of relaunch it with all the challenges that it uh, involves? Is it helping the society at large or...? There are two aspects. The most important one, so I had the chance to be member of the Scientific Council of the National Research Fund before coming back and I, I heard about Lysam and what made me really come back was that I felt that Lysam didn't shine as at its true value and it's like I also have a little bit of a management background, so it's like a company that is worth less than its market value, but it's also uh, researchers, really excellent researchers that simply did not receive the recognition that they deserve. Well, when, was it, when was it started? And so in the end, who, who funds it or who is your stakeholder, let's say, or your reporting line, if any? Uh, we have, so we have an independent, we are fully independent, we have uh, a, a board of directors and I, uh, of course, report to our board of directors, uh, but we are also funded through a block grant that allows us to innovate and to discover new lines of research. We have a block grant from the Ministry of Higher Education and Research. Wonderful. Uh, can you give us an equivalent for the audience that's uh, typically also from abroad to have a bit of a benchmark of uh, what would be comparable to LISA in other countries in Europe or elsewhere? There is actually only one institute in Ireland that has a similar, um, I would say, institutional uh, set up uh, very often in other countries is actually included in universities. Here we are independent from the university. We collaborate with the university, but we are independent. Okay, uh, so I know that uh, the p papers you wrote are in different shapes and forms, uh, mm -hmm. and so you s kindly suggested maybe to take us through a presentation to frame mm -hmm. the discussion. Uh, please, audience, do ask questions to Professor Miller. This is the time as she goes through sometimes technical uh, content. I'm also looking forward to discover the slides with you. The idea of these webinars is also to be a little bit spontaneous, uh, but we all have the same aim, which is how do we get out of of the crisis, how do we make sure if there's another bout of, uh, of pandemic, how do we deal with it? And this is all helped by uh, the very complex, at least from our perspective, models that you've been building as a mathematician and finance uh, expert. Uh, so Professor Miller, let's spend maybe uh, how, however long you need, 15, 20 minutes on your slides, maybe mm -hmm. longer if we interrupt you too much. Uh, but you don't can. hesitate. No problem. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much. And then we'll go through more Q&A uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. Okay. I share. Probably not. Yeah, well, I'm not at the beginning. No, let me first check something. Yeah. Let me, yeah. Do you see the slides? Mm -hmm. Oh. We no? did, and then they disappeared. <laughs> okay. Then let me make sure. There, here they are. Great. So, <clears throat> yeah. Here Liza. Okay. okay, Liza, here we are. Okay, uh, a brief presentation, but I, I, I just said it. Uh, our aim is to, to, to do excellent research, but not only. It's not only about publications. Uh, it's most importantly about impact to society and really help society transform and develop. Uh, nevertheless, also in this development, what was extremely important for me when I also reorganized Eliza was to take also into account and to give credit to the interdependence 
of these changes and transformation of society. And also that society does not transform perhaps as expected and definitely not at the speed that we sometimes expect. And it goes very often much faster than, uh, than foreseen. And that's what we see also here with the digitalization. Digitalization is there, but there are also uh, an increased mobility in terms of, of migration and interconnection of problems, because if you have um, both population, but also working force changing uh, con continuously, you have a whole range of socioeconomic problems that are linked to it. And that's also will make preferences among households, among people change over time, will change the way we, we have, we will adapt our consumption behavior, how we will make our choices in terms of work-life balance. And these will actually create, all these changes will create new norms and new ways uh, to take decisions. That's why, so because all these, um, different aspects of society are actually evolving together. We structured LISA according to uh, a matrix structure where we are continuously working together. And there is a research force based on three departments and three uh, interdisciplinary research programs that are feeded and that are uh, nourished through two platforms. One, uh, it's the data platform, because as we have said, we are taking information from society, from the economy, and we are transforming it into uh, scientific knowledge in order to advance society. We do this through the data center and through the behavioral and experimental economic center. These two uh, platforms feed our work our work uh, from a labor market perspective, from a living condition perspective, from an urban development and mobility perspective, but also interdisciplinary. Uh, when we look at crossing borders and there we look at both migration and uh, our cross-border workers here in, in Luxembourg, uh, health and health systems, because it's uh, an extremely uh, determinant factor for the evolution of society and of course also digital transformation. So that's how we reorganize actually LISA in order to address the challenges that are coming. And uh, we see here in the COVID crisis that the way we are actually set up uh, enables us also to very rapidly provide answers to the problems. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit ironic, but it seems like you were set up and waiting for something like this to happen to put all your uh, all your all your synergies and uh, efforts uh, in play would not striking <laughs> and so it looks like an introduction to covid when actually you you were set up obviously not knowing this would happen we were we were i have to admit that a couple of months months and years uh, we were more preparing to the digital transformation in in order to accompany as much as possible and as as good as possible uh, Luxembourg digital strategy, but also yep. the migration challenges that we are facing. But I have to admit that here in the COVID crisis, I was extremely happy to have these, all these interdependencies because we have worked very closely together to address such a challenge in the only possible way, which means to take the interdependencies into account. And that's, also at the essence of the model that I will present in a couple of minutes. Great. Uh, here we are. So we have, we are approximately 150 people, 26 nationalities. We are, we are fully international. It's extremely fun to, to, to work at LISA and to have a coffee at LISA, but that's you know, quite rare at this time. Um, we are working very closely with a whole range of international organizations, especially European Commission, United Nations, we WHO, uh, the World Bank. We have, of course, uh, international network. We have a lot of universities around the world with whom we work together. I told you before, we have a data center whose um, mission is both to collect data, but also to archive data, to manage data, and to make it accessible to the research community and to society. And, and, and Aline, you never know, maybe you have future talent to watching us. What is the typical profile of your most technical staff members? And then, of course, other types of profiles. 
because I, I didn't I didn't expect you to have 150 people I mean it's huge uh, yeah uh, out of the 150 people we have uh, 90 researchers with PhDs of course so we have uh, junior researchers who are doing their PhD but we also have uh, postdocs and uh, senior researchers uh, among the people I just presented to you uh, who are leaders of our department and research programs of course, we have, um, we have also senior full professors who came over and who were attracted to this mission that we, we defined together. But uh, on the other hand, what talents we are looking for right now, one of the big changes uh, in society, but also in social sciences and in economics is data science. And we are really always and continuously uh, recruiting people who are really also data scientists and who I have, I would say, this double profile of being both economist and, uh, and data scientists, but not only economists, because we also have sociologists and other, but we have definitely an aim to have a full power to extract as much as possible and out of uh, more and more complex information uh, channels the information in order to feed our work. That's the challenge for us, for our work, technical work, I would say, in the upcoming years. Impressive. And I also see your network of uh, affiliations is just huge. So you are not working in your corner here, away from the world. On the contrary, everything you do, I guess, takes into account their input and vice versa. Yeah, we are closely, so we have, we are present in uh, a, a really wide variety of networks, of circles. This can be, for instance, in inequality, we have a, a very uh, far reaching network and migration. We have a very rich network as well. Uh, in all the topics, real estate, um, there, there is also an, an important a network with whom we work both North Europe, South Europe, the US and Asia. So we have a, a, a very broad network with whom we are also closely working both in projects but also sometimes simply here also in, in the COVID crisis we, we really used our network to get information also from what is happening actually in our, in our partner countries. Thank you. So we should all subscribe to your uh, newsletter, or whatever, to receive your articles. Yeah. 80 per year. I mean, incredible. It's more than one w once per week. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. And we are organizing a lot of events where we we are we are more than welcoming because again we are we are. Our aim is to be as close as possible to the economy and to society. So we we really want, and we are also investing a lot of. Uh, energy and training into citizen science, into really as close as possible to, to the field and to the economy. Okay, okay. so that's our slogan. So we, we, we uh, defined it together, all together last year, Science and Lightning Society. That's exactly our value. We want to produce excellent research, but that helps transforming and developing society and economy. But the, the, when for you, society includes the notion of the economy being part of it. Of course, I think a society without economy, and we, we know that uh, the development of the economy has huge implication also for the socioeconomic and social dimension of life. And yep. the, the way people work and where they work and how they work will have a a determinant implications for the way they will actually live together. That's what we, and also uh, the working, so that the change of the work will completely change the way we will train people, we will educate them in school. So uh, the economy is now there's one of, of the important yep. driver of change in, in society and the most crucial. So thanks to this uh, structure and how we are actually uh, organized, we could very rapidly, and that's really, we, we, 
we started as as any other company i would say uh, to to go into lockdown and to confinement on the 15th of, of march but right after we were um, i would say two days after we were already uh, setting up uh, vp7 so our commitment to vp7 and we took the leadership of vp7 in the research task force uh, of luxembourg VP7, its aim was to uh, go out and evaluate the socioeconomic implication of the crisis and to help also uh, to assist um, the government, but also the different stakeholders in the predictions to be made at the socioeconomic level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to stress that at the beginning of the crisis, so we, we, we started with publishing an, a, a report um, early April on the economic implications of, uh, of the crisis. We recognized that the priority should be health, uh, but that there were detrimental uh, damages made to the economy mm -hmm. but what we were a little bit uh, frustrated was this um, this confrontation between the health dimension and the economic dimension and that's I think also at the origin of this need to develop a model that integrates the two dimension okay and that's what we did, uh, what uh, Frédéric Dauquier actually, with a whole range of uh, economists, uh, um, so young economists, Michal Boczynski and Joel Machado, but also epidemiologists and uh, economists, both from Statec, from the university, from LISA, together actually developed a model that, actually, that, mm, that predicts the health and economic effects of uh, the lockdown, but also afterwards of the deconfinement strategies. And that's actually what we are currently doing. Yeah. And it should, of course, be tailor made to Luxembourg. Tailor made to Luxembourg. Luxembourg is extremely specific, <laughs> we all know, <laughs> unique. Um, it has, it's a, a very small country, a very productive uh, country with, uh, with, with a strong economy, but um, dependence of this economy on also cross border workers. Yep. And we have uh, almost 50% of our workforce coming from. Uh, our borders coming from our neighboring countries is also in terms of uh, modeling the health implications will have an, an influence and we have of course a very specific setup and portfolio of industries and within these industries also for each industry we we do have a differential uh, percentage of cross-border workers. We have also sometimes um, more parents, young parents, when schools close down, this has an importance and that's what we took into account. Um, so that's really the model we, we built or I would say uh, our group of researchers built under the coordination of Frédéric Dauquier. It's an economic block, that's an input-output with a macroeconomic um, a block of the economy really showing how uh, the Luxembourg economy works. It had been calibrated pre-crisis, uh, so uh, depending on the interrelationships uh, that we calibrated before the crisis between the 19 sectors. There are 19 sectors. Now in the crisis periods, they, can, they will be potentially in lockdown or not in lockdown. And all these sectors are uh, characterized by differential densities uh, of workers on the workplace. They, are, they have also a differential possibility to have homeworking organized, etc. And all these factors are taken into account in the model. And this labor force, of course, is confronted with a virus. And there we have then uh, the, the Luxembourg labor force, which is, of course, with its diversity, extremely interesting to, to, to look at. And that's also why uh, this model has received also a lot of attention from international organization and at the uh, European level is because we have modeled the fact that this labor force comes from four different regions and can be in four Quite different unique. regions, uh, status this. with regard to the virus. Yeah, either susceptible, so we don't know, infected symptomatic, in, infected asymptomatic or recovered. 
So we have these four different statuses for workers and these workers coming from four different regions. And there uh, we will then model for each in each sector and for each uh, workforce, the probability to be infected either at the workplace or at home. So, and this at home can be uh, in social life. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then being dependent on the level of infection in these different countries. So that's also the challenge because we will have then shocks, potentially shocks entering from outside if there are not same levels of, um, of contaminations in different countries. And that's also extremely important because it shows that without coordination between countries, uh, we are not New Zealand, we are Luxembourg. Uh, so we cannot uh, simply close the borders and we cannot close our economy. Maybe we will become a case study in terms of how to model these kind of uh, eventualities because we are so codependent. Huh? What would be the best example of that? I think, uh, but in, in, in many fields in which we operate, we consider that Luxembourg is actually a testbed and perfect testbed and should be a privileged partner also for the EU Commission, because sometimes things that happen at Luxembourg today will happen in, uh, in a couple of years mm -hmm. at the European level. Yep. And what we able to do also in the large phase of testing that other countries could envisage to do uh, in a couple of years. Oh, I, I lost you there a little bit. Aline? <laughs> yeah. I, so I, 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 I lost the end of your point, but it doesn't matter. We can move forward. Mm. Okay. Uh, this model to be calibrated, calibrated from an economic perspective, but also calibrated uh, with, uh, from a health perspective. And there, uh, from a health perspective, we had actually uh, all the observation for the 19 sectors uh, of the infection rates uh, from end of March until mid-May and now uh, June. So we have all these infection curves empirically observed and we have modeled them according to, as I told you before, according to the risk of infection at the workplace that we developed based on the information that we had on each uh, industry. And there we see that except for some, um, uh, some industries, for, in for instance, in the mining industries, but you can imagine that here we have only very few observations. So it's, it's not a, a, a big problem because that's not, um, a, I would say, a significant industry within, uh, within Luxembourg, but we see that we nicely fit the observed curve. So our model um, with its parameterization, with its, uh, that simplifies actually the picture, Yep. is able to really get all the essence of what we observe. And we will continue calibrating right uh, now. And then we come to the results. Of course, we took as a benchmark what happens if lockdown until the end of the year. We see that before the lockdown, we had a reduction of the uh, national output uh, by 3%, mainly due to international trade rest restrictions and due to the crisis already appearing uh, in our partner countries. And then the lockdown that makes this uh, national output drop by 27%. But uh, of all European countries, Luxembourg was one of the least affected. Uh, yeah. do, do you know why? Is it because of the reliance on, you know, teleworking, which is allowed? We're not an industrial country as much as France or Germany. Yeah, indeed, because we see, uh, you, you see on the bottom left, the different, the different impacts. So we have a minus 27% uh, in total, but if we look at the different industries, we see that the different industries are very differentially actually affected. And of course, for instance, finance had only a minus 6% because it moved to telework. Um, so we had a whole range of, um, of sectors that could uh, um, shift their yeah. work to homeworking. And I will, I will show it more precisely in a couple of minutes. And uh, we see other sectors, for instance, food with restaurants and hotel, where, which are really strongly hit. 
And that's also what I show in the, in the next slide, is if we would have had to bring these teleworkers, um, uh, if we, we would have wanted to keep this minus 27%, but to, and therefore to be forced to put these workers in their offices on premises, we would have tripled the peak that we have seen uh, end of March, April. So, so it was right to close down the offices? It was right to close down, and I would say that it's, it's still right to, to keep the density and to keep homeworking where it's possible. The big question is now about the productivity of this homeworking. There we do not have, there is still a little bit of uncertainty, or there is still uncertainty, and we need more precise figures to have a good grasp on what's really happening in this efficiency of the work that is done by homeworking. But also, Professor, this is assuming the lockdown is going on until the end of the year and we are deconfining at the moment. So yeah. I guess you're tweaking the model then to actual uh, measures. Yeah, afterwards I will show you what, what it means. But here it's only to show in the worst case scenario, what does it mean to have people um, working from home and what would it have meant if we would have had to put these people in unemployment because then we would have faced a, a decrease in national output of more than 50 percent and there it would have been hard but this homeworking is really something uh, very important that we have to to study we have seen that it has been made possible through the I would say the start of digitalization, mm -hmm. but um, it's not as efficient as it should be because digitalization is, was not fast enough. And it's true that this COVID crisis has enormously has worked as an accelerator of digitalization. And now we will have to adapt the organizational and managerial form of uh, companies in order to uh, increase the productivity of homeworking. If yep as long as we need to use it in order to prevent uh, rebounds. Here is with, uh, with um, the deconfinement strategy. So we see that with the deconfinement, so the first uh, evolution in the output, you see it with the deconfinement of construction and then the full deconfinement will come at speed. There the way uh, economy goes back to normal but not totally to normal because we have still um, enormous constraints on international trade, goes back to normal is still to be taken carefully because we need to have a, a better understanding of how economy restarts. It's very quick to stop an economy. We have seen it. That has that, that has, has, has happened in a couple of days, but to restart an economy and to make sure that the supply chains work again, correctly takes time. And there uh, we also wait for the second wave of the survey of the Chamber of Commerce to have a better calibration of this restart of the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what it shows as well is that um, even in this restart, it's better to keep people homeworking. Horesca does not, if we keep Horesca, the, the start of Horesca, because sometimes from some people, the start of Horesca was really, uh, people were extremely afraid of it. But Horesca with the social distancing measures does not lead to a rebound. If well, it's, I, as a, sorry, yeah. I, as an industry that lives partially of, of traveling because our investments, our audiences are all over the place. The question that comes to mind then is, uh, is, uh, is traveling also going to be allowed to go back or does it then also uh, make the whole uh, <coughs> confinement, uh, how can I say, contingency planning wrong or defeated? And Aline, a lot of questions keep coming. So yeah. but I, I want to see if you're going to answer them first in your slides. But I have, I have already four questions for you. So let's see if we can maybe uh, okay. speed up to, to the results a little bit. Okay. Shall I continue then with the results and then, yeah, okay. Yep. We starting social life, that's, that's the most damageable for and will really trigger, uh, would we trigger a rebound of the uh, epidemic, especially because of its meaning. Because that's also um, 
fairly nicely shown here in another paper that uh, Nikos Askitas, Kostas and Bertrand Verheiden, also economists uh, at LISA have developed and have shown uh, by analyzing 135 different countries because thankfully these countries have not adopted this restriction at the same time and in the same sequence and so they could really isolate what is the impact of a restriction independent of other restrictions being present and what we see is that the cancellation of public events has the really the strongest impact and there are also um, for different reasons because a public event let's take for instance a soccer game a big international soccer game people come from far away and 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 come together and in addition, there are very strong social norms associated to these public events that make that are not really in line with social distancing. And this will create actually also social norms outside um, of these public events that will actually make social distancing more difficult in daily life and will also trigger contamination ways that will not be easily traceable because how can you, how will you actually trace back with whom you were there? So it's also from a sector perspective and from a territory perspective extremely difficult to, to, to control. And that's, I think, one of the, the important messages there. Testing. Luxembourg has, uh, it has appeared again uh, in, in the international press. Luxembourg is really at the forefront. It's an example in large scale testing and it works. So we see even with uh, one month's testing um, frequency, we could really control the epidemic. So even if there would be a second wave triggered through social events or triggered to, through uh, any other uh, second wave would actually be able to be controlled if we have frequent testing but frequent testing is not mandatory uh, so it's extremely important to uh, inform people that it's a collective project and um, that they have an incentive because they have to there is a trade-off when you get tested they have the trade-off of Shall I get tested or not? Because is it not more expensive for me if mm -hmm. I get tested and I get positive, then they, I have these sanctions, I have to isolate, etc. This might have economic costs. So uh, we but have there to bring over the idea of a collective project. And, and there again, Luxembourg is a, is, a, is a test bed. I think I have somewhere here my letter to go and get tested for free. Mm -hmm. and uh, but it's true that all these consequences have to be taken into account See, because you're speaking of testing can i interrupt you with the first question yeah uh, obviously global healthcare now is uh, the most uh, uh, strategic st sector across the world and in the light of the current outbreak what is your view of how healthcare is gonna evolve and how ha has it already changed from your research in terms of uh, the way it's dealt with by the government. Uh, I don't know, you know, the, the, the person who asked the question I know well, but uh, I don't know if he means in terms of uh, focusing on it or funding it, but it's in general what you've seen changing in healthcare already. I think two things have been uh, really demonstrated and have been have become visible here in, in this crisis is the lack of coordination uh, across Europe in the healthcare uh, provision and the healthcare uh, system. Uh, the second one is indeed that um, not enough investment and perhaps not rightly focused investment uh, in the healthcare system. Uh, so I think that investment strategy definitely are currently in the phase of, of adapting because of these pandemics, they I think the literature is extremely clear. These pandemics were foreseen. Were the investment in the healthcare system um, prepared for that, adapted to this uh, emergence of these pandemics? I don't think so, but I think that um, uh, there is a more, now there is a, a, a very, con I, I'm, it's, it's sad that we had to come there, but there is a very hard, um, price that is attached to um, the preparation of the healthcare system. So now we all realize that 
because we had a, a limited capacity in our healthcare system, we had to lock down the economy because that's also what we did. We locked down because we knew that if we would not lock down, we would have had a pandemic where we would not be able to um, heal and to uh, put assist the people that were sick. Okay. So the the economic price is now, and also when we when we when we as a task force when we prepared this large scale testing, we provided the economic proof that it's a, a true and it's a. Um, a real investment for the future and this investment makes sense and makes also economically sense. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of investments, we have health tech is a big area as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, there is a business model framework that uh, investors in health tech should use to frame their thinking? Because now, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a blue sky horizon, it's a blue ocean. There is no limit to what we can imagine. So one of the questions I get as well is, what model do you think these health tech investors should use when they plan the future uh, and innovation? Um, the business model they, they should have in mind, I think that they are very diverse in the different subsectors. But what I, uh, what I do uh, for sure know is that um, these black swan events have to be, these uh, low probability events have to get more attention in the, the business model in the healthcare section, like in other sectors as well. I think that's also has been, has been demonstrated during the, the crisis here. And that the resilience of the, uh, the, the, the different models that will be put in place will play uh, uh, it, it's very important to what you say, Professor, because I know that a lot of the discussions in the VC space has been around the fact that the business plans did never really factored in a black swan event, and mm -hmm. now it should become a norm. So I yeah. think that answers the question very well. Uh, can I continue with the questions, or do you want to move on a little bit? Uh, no, you can continue, and then I will move on. If there is one still yes, late. Yeah. yeah, one had to do with the previous slide on teleworking actually mm -hmm. so uh, have you have you got the results available of the project on how you upskill uh, the the workers digitally or is no, it going to come uh, this is kind of come and we have actually different um, we have uh, different work there so we have uh, the project here is specifically targeted to the crisis and the upskilling during the crisis um, of workers, but we have more generally also uh, a, a very big project, SMART, uh, at our labor market department where we hired, I showed you before, yeah. we hired Christina Gutmann uh, in order to accompany this digitalization of the labor force because we will see um, both uh, on the demand side, on the labor market and on the supply side, that this transformation of digitalization will uh, bring a whole range of dynamics that we have to be able to proactively manage. And that's exactly the point. And we have received uh, a very official mandate by the government of Luxembourg to put in place a um, skills observatory in order to uh, prepare and to uh, a company also Luxembourg Digital Strategy, because I'm very happy that Luxembourg recognized that going for a digital strategy without preparing and having a, a solid uh, strategy in terms of uh, skills development, you will not make it. So it's about technique, but it's about skills yes. also. <laughs> so we should definitely have you back when this is ready. Okay, very happy to, to come and to present with Christine. Yep. That. Big pleasure. What we do as well, and that's more from a, then we go more in the micro level, is to see, okay, there is a shock. How, do, how does this shock will actually translate? And that's there we will come into how this workforce will change, how the revenues will change, because um, demand in the different sectors will change due to the crisis. Um, so salaries will change and labor force will be much more mobile, will perhaps change uh, sectors, etc. So all these effects on the distribution of revenues, but also on the search of labor force mobility, this is something that we are also now investigating in order to um, 
anticipate, because that's, uh, I think, um, the mode in which we switch now, we have, we have provided now information within the, the crisis in order to explain what's happening, but also anticipate what happens if we open up this or this sector. Mm -hmm. But now we want to be more to go into an anticipation mode where we really tell, okay, if we do this and that, this could be a scenario, this could be a different scenario. So we provide projections in order to be able to uh, help decision makers um, to take their decision based on facts and to anticipate. Very important for private equity because as we know, there's a lag in the, how you value your portfolio over time and everybody wants to know when will we be finally able to measure the full impact of the crisis to anticipate the future indeed. So uh, let's look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the future will depend, of course, on the possible second wave or not. The yep. future will also depend on how long we will keep the social distancing measure. The future will depend on um, the level of density of workers that we will allow in our, on our workplace. All these factors will have a, a, a crucial impact on... Um, and what, what do you think, if I ask you, uh, based on your experience and all the model simulations that you've been doing, well, what is your recommendation today for businesses and for families? And especially everybody's looking to their travel plans for the summer and everybody, <laughs> including LPA, is keen on uh, restarting public events, yeah? Yeah, as I said, I, we, are, we are very careful with public events, um, especially public events more on the social dimension. Uh, here, I, I would like to make the, a distinction between uh, a soccer game and um, a, a professional public event, because I think that public events in the professional sphere can be organized uh, keeping social distancing measures. So I would say that as long as public events can afford it to keep social distancing measures, um, they, sh they do will most probably not trigger strong, uh, strong rebounds of the mm -hmm. contamination wave. However, um, uh, more so in, in the more personal social sphere, public events would need to be uh, uh, kept to uh, at this small stage, groups. Still, uh, to small groups, also for traveling. Um, I personally, I will not go to a beach this summer <laughs> because I think that these sort of very, um, yeah, uh, having people at uh, one place, but of course that I'm totally against borders. And I think that's also the coordination. We cannot, as Luxembourg, we cannot say that we, we, we support decisions that have been taken by some countries to close borders because closing borders simply does not make sense. This is not the solution. It's simply together in a coordinated way followed social distancing measures. And I think if this message, we could bring it through also throughout Europe, that would be a, a definitely a, a, a big plus for the future. Okay. Great, let's see. Of course, it's also important, and that's um, also information that we will receive about uh, for, for this homeworking from this telework dimension. We are currently conducting a survey in order to have a better understanding of how workers, how the population went through this crisis, to know how they worked, how efficiently they worked, how, what were the difficulties they were facing when they worked, were there technical difficulties, were it more because they had children at home, etc. How yeah. do you collect this data? Is it a survey, is it focus groups or? Survey. So here it's a wide survey that we have launched through social media, press, etc. We are collecting this data. Can we participate in it? I haven't seen it. Maybe ah, you can send I, it to our community. I will, yeah, I will send you the link. Definitely. Uh, we are, of course, complementing this data also, for instance, in the mobility dimension. We are complementing this data also from other data sources where we try to follow the density of population because we know that, for instance, bringing people back to work 
uh, even if in their workplace they have a low density, will have um, will create more density in public transport, and there again social interactions might might appear. So all these dimensions also of mobility ne need to be taken into account, mm -hmm. and of course changes and uh, really profound changes uh, in um, lifestyle the way um, also health um, behaviors have substantially changed during this crisis and that's what we want to extract and this information i think it's extremely valuable also to put to be able to anticipate what kind of um, what kind of ways of working what kind of models should be taken into account uh, for for the future of organizations of companies how they organize themselves what they should take care of uh, this is also valuable information here and then preferences so preferences change as well because we have had a very uh, stressful period where uh, people had to stay within their family close there was this homeworking sometimes creating a little bit of attention in uh, the balance of power with into a household um, but also in our mindset how we will consume how we will spend our money how we will save our money how we will act with risk how will we be more risk averse all but, this but, we have a, a tremendous economic time uh, i mean empirically we discuss this every day in our lives and businesses but the question is are these lasting changes or are they just gonna impact your model until you know this epidemic is uh, maybe not disappearing but uh, fading down it will take time to fade down because the economic crisis is only at its start. Huh? So we, we, we know that. So in, I would say the health behavior um, might perhaps um, the impacts in the way people, how healthy people will, will remain because we have seen the search as, as, you said, as you saw, there have been plenty of bicycles sold, etc. So that people do more sports, etc. was perhaps really triggered by this lockdown but from an economic perspective we have here we are in front of the strongest most severe economic crisis of almost this century mm -hmm. it has come out out of the oecd report so here i think that in terms of uh, economic decision making here we have long lasting changes we will which will change the consumption behaviors of the population will change their saving behavior, will change the attitude to risk. There, I think we will have uh, profound changes. And the changes that will be actually triggered through children, because children also as well went through an episode mm -hmm. that will most probably affect their um, even Later, yeah, choice, attitudes. profession choice, etc. Yeah. How I'm very curious to see how they will talk about this crisis when they will be 18, even my kids. <laughs> That's very true. Cool. I think you are broadening our minds and also helping us project a bit more during lockdown. It's very difficult to think beyond. But now that we are emerging and we see both sides of the coin, uh, this should frame our thinking mm -hmm. uh, much more. So, yes, thank you for that. We have, let's say, 10 more minutes to go. Are there any s more slides that you would like to focus on before maybe the final questions? No, the, the other part we are working on is on self-reporting of symptoms and interactions. Well, that's extremely, from a scientific perspective, from a understanding the disease perspective, extremely rich. We are working there with, with a startup. What is extremely important for us is to keep the privacy and confidentiality of the data uh, of uh, people who would participate. But there as well, if we would could have a sequence of what people do, again, in their professional life and in their social life, and how um, evolves actually their, 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 their disease status, that is something which could be extremely rich that we would like to do uh, by protecting in the most strict way the confidentiality of the data. We, have, we are working there with an extraordinary partner from a, it's a startup here in Luxembourg that is end-to-end -end crypting and really taking care of the, the confidentiality. Can you, can you say their name? Kixel. 
No, that's good because yeah. we are in the business of supporting also startups. And, yeah. uh, and uh, Professor, this is an important point because one of our uh, viewers also asked about how we as consumers will behave towards healthcare with evolving technology. And uh, of course, privacy is an integral part of this. Mm -hmm. uh, so you seem to be very concerned about it, but there are also voices who say, well, after all, with Facebook and Instagram, we already gave up our privacy Right, so why should we be worried about this kind of uh, privacy? I don't know what your view is on this, but... Uh... Um, my, my view is extremely also de dependent on our mission. We have the task to exploit the data that is produced by society in order to produce common good, to really to, to, to give it back to society in some way. But I'm deeply convinced that we will only be, be able to do it in a sustainable and long-term way if we are extremely strict on the privacy and confidentiality. I know Facebook, etc. I sometimes we are we we have to, to fight in order to have access to data, but we claim that there is a possibility to have a much broader access to data, in, especially also in Luxembourg, because we are an extremely digitalized uh, country. We have the possibility to collect and to have access to data. If we set up the frame and the, uh, the, the systems that enable us and to enable science to have access to this data by protecting the privacy of people. And if we manage this here in Luxembourg and here as well, we can be at the forefront in Europe, but also in the world. If we manage to do this um, by following strict rules, because it's, I think it's extremely dangerous. I, I would be, um, as, as a socioeconomic institute, I would find my, my entire business model could actually fall down if I would be yeah, if I, I somebody could show that I have misused data. Mm -hmm. So it's for me a guarantee of the sustainability of our work to make it as um, secure as possible. See, see like this, it seems like a condition for success. And okay. I, I know in your papers you shared with us kindly, uh, you do uh, look at worst and best case scenarios. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but I'm just... Uh, mindful that people are still watching us and maybe want some sort of conclusion. Uh, the worst case scenario that you outline, is it really the worst case or can it get worse? And, uh, and I also want to understand uh, what are your recommendations in the end for business owners or investors who are uh, calibrating their appetite for investing based on the risk of relapse, uh, based on the uh, full economic impact of, uh, of the pandemic? And of course, in the best case scenario uh, configuration, if let's say they find a vaccine or something miraculous happens, how does that impact your model in turn? Uh, so a white swan as opposed to a black swan. <laughs> um, worst case scenario, of course, would be that we would have a rebound uh, through social gatherings and social and public events here in Luxembourg added to an second wave coming also from uh, external countries. This would really, if we, if we would have uh, the, the two impacts and, and these two implications at the same time, and this would really generate a rebound. And there, to, if we would really have to go back into lockdown, uh, that would, that's for us the, the worst case scenario, especially because we also believe that the second lockdown in, from a health perspective would not be as efficient as the first one because people would not uh, strictly follow it anymore because they, they really believed and I think there was a really collective endeavor to, to control the epidemic the first time. I'm not sure that it would so it would cause as much economic damage, but would not have the same health benefits. So that's really the, the, the worst case scenario. Yep. Um, secondly, um, the, best, the best is of course, we control. We, uh, we, we are able to identify where is the virus through our large scale testing. We, 
we control the situation and even there if we there would be external shocks through traveling we could keep control of the situation and it's possible so it's technically possible if we continue to invest in large scale testing and if we have the engagement of the population but also our cross border population to participate in this large scale testing mm -hmm. um, what we should learn from it is to better anticipate and i yeah. think now everything will depend both from our public decision maker and from the private decision maker are to be able to integrate in their projections in their planning these different scenarios and there are middle of the scenarios i took now have the you, extremes, but anticipate have you, have you been working closely with the government on all these scenarios and assumptions we have been as the research task force we have been mandated to um, accompany them as a monitoring tool so we are providing them with the different these different scenarios we are we are explaining the different characteristics what are their probabilities what are their characteristics uh, what are their i would say preconditions yeah okay i think that's more than fascinating professor what are there any other slides that you wanted to share with us no. or can i uh, yeah. I, no, I will stop. Have, thank you so much. Uh, one of the questions is about how do you deal with people if they're reluctant to being tested, the, the PCR test? If that, that limit the quality of your findings? Uh, yeah, that's that's one of the, the that's one of the preconditions. So I think that uh, we have all recognized that the, the determinant factor will be communication about pre, about this testing. So how do you correctly incentivize people to get tested? Because it's not trivial. So, so we have behavioral and experimental scientists working on it and who have really outlined what are the pros and cons so getting tested. And we have to take this into account that there are also exist in the minds of people cons to get to get tested. So it's part of our but, social duty as a citizen. Yeah, exactly. I think it's 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 not uh, an option anymore to try to make them afraid that if you not get tested, etc. No. In current but, period, but I mean, I, I, I did the antibody test and it, it does feel maybe better first because it's a blood test. And yeah. do, do, do you, can you, are you happy with both or what is one better than the other? Um, the, the, the possibility, I think PCR tests, if you, if you do them regularly, um, uh, give for us, for our modeling and for our results, give the same information. Okay. But, but you can do one or the other. People for their personal, I would say, decision-making prefer the serologic test. Yeah. Okay, so Professor, conclusion is we are not out of the woods, but we can start to see the light or continue to see the light if we, be, if we keep these behaviors and if we keep feeding information to you and your uh, fellow stakeholders and to fine tune the model slowly. Uh, mm -hmm. But I guess we won't really have a fully clear picture and I don't want to be pessimistic, just realistic, uh, before I guess the end of the year when we have a full season round or uh and, and and you have to tell us how we can help you do an even better job and beside by not going to too many crowded beaches and not <laughs> holding very big uh large number people conferences yeah um i fully agree i think our capacity we have to be we have to remain optimistic because i think we have to but this optimism should be um supported and built on our capacity to anticipate. So mm -hmm. if we are good in predicting and in being prepared for different scenarios, that will definitely make the difference. And I think that Luxembourg and our economy can make it. But we also have to have a clearer view on uh, what are really uh, the determinants of our productivity in these differential modes of working that we yeah. are facing now. So, so this digital upskilling. Yeah. Digital upskilling will be part of our lives, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Uh, and we have to optimize the productivity based on that. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I mean, I still feel like we're very privileged to be here in Luxembourg uh, because you manage quickly to get a global view and the macro is somehow uh, manageable, it seems. And everybody seems to be aligned from public and private sector. So, so please, we would love to answer your survey. 
We have uh, thousands of contacts in our community. We represent a chunk of apparently the industry that was one of the least affected, lucky us again, so mm -hmm. double luck. Uh, <laughs> and so we should contribute as much as we can and until we can host you live probably after the summer for an even uh, broader picture of, of where we stand. Yeah. I definitely also for digitalization of work and the future of work and all this transformation that is happening uh, in our economy and in our industries, love really to have also your insight if we could uh, organize an event and exchange. We are also extremely eager to get also inputs uh, uh, from different fields. So as you, we are, we all have data science at the heart of our businesses, I think. Uh, and if we could find synergies also between us, it would oh, be so great. Maybe, maybe let's think of a, of a project about teleworking and all related fields. Uh, maybe first a round table with some key members, big employers, and then we can expand it to more financial industries beyond the private equity. Exactly. Yeah, would be. Okay. Telework so we... and digitalization of work. Yeah, that's okay. really, yeah. We will, we will take that offline. And Aline, also you'll be invited as an inspiring lady because we have our group of uh, PE for women, as you know, to promote women in finance, in private mm -hmm. equity. And uh, you are a role model for many of us. So I hope you'll find time to tell us about how you manage it all. It seems really incredible. <laughs> With pleasure and passion. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the Thank time. You. Good luck. And uh, we look forward to the survey. Okay, I will send it to you. Have with a good pleasure. weekend, everybody, and see you for the last two weeks of uh, our webinars uh, starting Monday with the 17 Capital, EIF, uh, and Lombard International next week. Um, thank you so much, and everybody have a good weekend. Thank you, Professor. Great to see you. Thank you.